as for the substance of this latest uh, this latest comedy bit from John Oliver, you know, it it goes without saying, of course, that if any white person did exactly this same thing, but directed it at a black liberal instead, then they would be condemned as racist by the entire media and everybody on the left. And, you know, they, they would be trying to put them in jail probably for it. Um, and it would, you know, because, because obviously, right, uh, you got a white guy trying to buy off a black public official. It's openly saying this guy is for sale. I'm buying you. The Daily Wire's Matt Walsh continues to show how big of a dork he is. We can't show the footage, but long story short, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who has been proven... Last week, ProPublica revealed that virtually every year for decades, Thomas has been treated to luxury vacations by billionaire conservative donor Harlan Crow, including trips on his private jet and super yacht worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, which, crucially, Thomas never disclosed in his uh, financial disclosures. Now we've learned there are other financial dealings between the two men that Thomas also didn't disclose. In 2014, Crow bought several properties in this quiet residential neighborhood in Savannah, Georgia, that had belonged to Clarence Thomas and his relatives, including a house where Thomas's mother was still living and two vacant house lots. The purchase marks the first known instance of money flowing from Crow to Thomas. And although a Watergate era law requires justices and other officials to disclose details of most real estate sales over a thousand dollars, and this was one hundred thirty three thousand dollars, Thomas never disclosed his sale of the properties. In fact, Thomas has gone silent. He has not responded to the report today. Crow has issued a statement. He says he purchased Thomas's mother's house to preserve it for posterity. But as Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat of Connecticut, tweeted last week, it's not like Harlan Crow is some apolitical pal of Thomas. He constantly has cases before the Supreme Court. He funds groups that argue for outcomes that benefit him. One group filed eight briefs before the court. Thomas sided with Crow in all eight cases. That he can be wooed with lavish gifts and trips, including his love for RVs on Last Week Tonight. Thus, John Oliver had a fun moment where he dared Clarence Thomas to step down, continue making money from HBO, and receive the granddaddy RV of them all. Um, and in any other context, that would be, it would be considered to be just uh, insanely racist. But those rules are suspended, of course, because it's Clarence Thomas, and they despise him, and they despise him, in fact, significantly more than they despise any white person who has the same ideas, or even any other, I mean, you might, like, why are they so hung up on Clarence Thomas? There, there are other conservatives on the Supreme Court, not enough, in my opinion, not enough uh, uh, um, reliable ones, but why all this special vitriol for Clarence Thomas? And the answer is that uh, because he's black, and so they consider his conservatism to be sort of a betrayal. No, Matt, you dimwit. It's corruption. The lengths of corruption. It's the fact that he refuses to recuse himself in cases where there is a clear-cut conflict of interest. John Oliver believes that he owns Clarence Thomas. He believes that Thomas, being a black man, belongs to him ideologically and the fact that he isn't cooperating the fact that he that he is his own man with his own point of view sends guys like john oliver into a rage the the the, the amount of undisguised contempt that they have for this guy i mean starting with the fact he's calling clarence thomas by his first name you know not using his proper title spitting in his face basically calling into question his basic integrity as a man and uh, he feels absolutely entitled to do all of that because Thomas has betrayed him by not being a Marxist ghoul. All of this is filled with falsehoods. But Matt, do me one better. Define Marxism, bud. Now, you know that uh, I'm not one to do the whole uh, Dems are the real racist bit. You know, that's not my that's not my thing. You know how I feel about that generally. But in this case, you really just can't help but notice that John Oliver literally treats the guy like an escaped slave. That, that is actually how he treats him. I mean, he's trying to buy him back. <laughs> That's what he's doing. And uh, he's doing all this while being painfully unfunny on top of it, which is the real, which again, that is the real offense here. Matt Walsh, maybe not the best judge of character. Let's get into it. All of this, along with the token female sideline reporters and the female analysts at halftime, 
It's an effort to make the game less appealing to the people the game was invented for to begin with. He's gone after female sideline reporters for simply existing. Lindsay, though, worse than the average, even as far as female sports reporters go, is definitely not the only female to enter into this mostly male space and seek to feminize it. She wants the football stadium to be quiet and gentle, considerate, respectful of personal space. She wants it to be a more feminine environment. And he's even gone after hockey. And yeah, on hockey, you've got, first of all, fighting after the play is part. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's cool. The fact that you can just beat the hell out of each other for reasons. It's nothing to do with what's actually happening on the, I don't know, I've never watched hockey, but I guess two guys get mad at each other and they just beat the hell out of each other. And it's understood that that's what you're going to do. I got to deduct points based on the fact that you are, that you are on ice skates, which is a little bit. You know, it's like, that's what figure skaters use. And it's like, it's a little bit sort of dainty. You know, you're ice skating around. You can never, you can never be fully manly on ice skates or on, it's like on rollerblades. And yet when there's any sort of backlash to his anti-trans rhetoric. How many people have had this done? Depends on what, I don't think we have exact numbers, but it's, if we're talking about the drugs, it's, I mean, millions. Um, are you talking about human hormone blockers? It says of. over the last five years, there were at least 4,780 adolescents who started puberty blockers. Yeah, I mean, I, I would guess, you know, hundreds of thousands at this, but I could be wrong. Million sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Like a simple question from none other than Joe freaking Rogan. Dude crumbles. Womanhood is a costume that you can put on and wear. This is especially ironic given the concern for cultural appropriation that you find these days. If it is appropriation for a white man to dress like a black man, is it not appropriation for a man to dress like a woman? Why doesn't anyone ever talk about female appropriation? That is real appropriation. You've got women, you've got, you, 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 you go to a drag show, you've got men dancing around in women's clothes. Making a mockery and a parody of womanhood. <sighs> it is like a female minstrel show. It is female blackface. <sighs> And feminists just sit back and take it. It's like watching the majority of the part. I don't believe that men and women are equal, and I don't believe that they should have all the same roles or responsibilities in society. I do not apologize. In fact, by all rights, you sick freaks should be the ones apologizing to me. Ah, uh, yes. Everyone should be apologizing to Matt Walsh for thinking he was uh, pretty creepy in defending the notion that teen girls get pregnant. Uh, that was a statement that he had made on a radio show some years back. It was uh, unearthed by Media Matters. And for those of you who are wondering, what did he say exactly? Well, here's a snippet of that clip. Teen pregnancy is a new problem. <laughs> yes. In the sense that it's only recently that we decided that it is a problem. Recently, in the last 30 years or so, we decided that that's way too young to start a family. Why? And uh, because now the we- Force rates would probably go up. And once you're that young, you can't really make sure that well, you know- Well, no, girls are- No, 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 no. Girls were getting married early and marriages were lasting longer. You very rarely hear about like these, these relationships that go to their, uh, what is it, your diamond anniversary, your 50th anniversary and all this. I, it, it's, that's a dying breed of people out yeah, there. Yeah, and those all were all people that got married very young. That's why- That's why they're that's, still alive. Yeah, that's why you can have someone in their 70s who's celebrating their you know, uh, 55th wedding anniversary because they got married when they were teenagers. So what I'm saying is that the problem is not per se teenage pregnancy, it's unwed pregnancy. That's the problem in society. Smoothest brains in the world. Uh, your likelihood of divorce goes up considerably the younger you are when you get married. That's what the statistics entail, but that would require these uh, guys to read about it. If you can support the network, go to tyt.com slash join to keep us afloat. And if there are any stories that we have missed on this medium of TYT Sports, get at me and follow me, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. DMs are open, appreciate your suggestions.